Uh, we can start, I think. Uh, we're gonna have uh, we're gonna have an hour of discussion, so um, before lunch, so 20 to uh, 2 p.m. I guess uh, we're gonna be done. Um, I just wanted to maybe go over very quickly uh, over what each speaker said very very quickly in a few sentences to sort of recap and maybe refresh your memory, and then we can. Um, switch to questions and answers and discussion. Uh, we had uh, Professor Wali talking about Iran. He, he talked about the political struggles in Iran over the constitution uh, starting with the last century. And he stressed, the, he stressed that the Iranian constitution has this paradoxical nature wherein it has uh, democratic elements and theocratic elements. And he also said that these sort of signify the political struggles in the country between uh, secularists and the, and the uh, religious political forces right now. And uh, you know, this is the conflict in the country right now. Um, Professor Sinclair, he talked about Syria and the historical process there of constitution making. Um, and he talked about the opposition groups, Kurds mainly, which is the biggest opposition group and biggest ethnic minority in Syria. And uh, he talked about the conflict between the Arab nationalism and the, the Arab nationalist character of the state and institutions and uh, Kurdish uh, struggle for rights. And you know, he sort of stressed how these are still similar. Um, historically, the demands and the fears associated with them, you know, fears of disintegration and such, uh, they're sort of still lingering today. And he said that uh, it's gonna require a whole restructuring of the state, uh, as well as a new constitution if and when uh, Assad falls. And then we had um, Mr. Wali from the Kurdistan regional government who uh, talked about how for the Kurds, this is a multi-dimensional issue because it's not just you know the federal government, it's Iraq and then it's neighboring countries where Kurds also live. Um, and then he also said you know federalism in Iraq is not exactly working. Uh, in Pakistan it's confederalism. And um, even though I believe this is in your paper, you say you know federalism is the future system uh, for the entire world, but um, it's not working in Iraq and Iraq is going towards disintegration. And he talked a bit about why that is and why the two uh, nationalities can't and won't live together uh, successfully. And then uh, Mr. Chandar brought it back to Turkey and talked about, you know, with the Arab awakening or the uprisings or the Arab Spring, how um, Turkey is sort of put forward as an example for uh, some of these countries, especially Tun Tunis and Tunisia and uh, Egypt, and how, you know, Turkish foreign policy had to change in light of these developments, but also now how the Turkish constitution making is gonna be a very important uh, exam basically for Turkey if it wants to remain an example. And because others in the region are looking up to Turkey, this constitution is gonna sort of um, show or prove to what, it, to what extent um, this being you know, exemplary uh, can be justified. So, I mean, these are the points that I noted down, but I'm sure you remember other things that you wanna talk about, so um, there's gonna be a microphone, right? Microphone? Orda? Tamam. So, yes, please. If you uh, can say your name and then your question. Teşekkür ederim. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Zefer Üskül. I'm a uh, teacher at Doğuş University. Uh, we are discussing the Middle East, uh, North Africa, and Turkey with regard to the uh, writing of a new constitution. Actually, uh, maybe I should have talked in the afternoon uh, because that would have been uh, more relevant. It will be more than a question with your permission. Today, we are not discussing Morocco. However, in 2011, uh, as in the case of Tunisia and uh, Egypt and other countries. Also in Morocco, there was a trial to uprise. Uh, the, the people in Morocco tried to uh, make an uprising too. They have uh, transborder problems like the Western Sahara. And also there are problems created by, by the different ethnic groups. Therefore, there is a search for a spring also in Morocco. 
uh, and on the 20th of February to 2011, uh, there was a major demonstration prepared. But immediately afterwards, on the 9th of March, the king came up with the promise of a new constitution. They established a con uh, commission, and uh, in June, uh, they, they prepared the constitution, and it was uh, adopted and uh, promulgated as of July last year. So there was a change there, and finally, uh, it was uh, quite an open and democratic uh, constitution in Morocco, uh, accepting the Barbary language as the second language even. So it was, to an unexpected degree, a very revolutionary uh, constitution, guaranteeing the rights of women, for instance, and putting the international conventions that uh, the Morocco has signed uh, to become superior to the national legislation and also the importance of the king is diminished it is uh, also foreseeing the responsibility of the king towards the parliament and its uh, uh, people although morocco is an islamic country the source of the constitution is found uh, is to be found in the uh, national sovereignty and the national and the people's will Obviously, the rights, the languages of minority are, have been put under protection in the new constitution and a, very, and a different uh, important uh, characteristic is that uh, it foresees an advanced decentralization. Not only the decentralization as foreseen by Mr. Chandar, no, it is an advanced decentralization. Uh, centralization that they are uh, now implementing. So this could be an example, or, or let me put it like that. It contains elements that would be an example to other countries uh, trying to prepare a new constitution. Thank you very much. And I have a question for Mr. Sinclair regarding Syria. Um, purity of origins. I think that some revolutions, and in particular the Syrian revolution, do find it useful to use part of their country's previous history, a specific phase in their history, as points of reference and maybe sources for inspiration in their struggle against the current regime. In the case of Syria, we see, for instance, that some prominent opposition lawyers and human rights defenders say we could indeed draw on earlier constitutions, like the constitution of 1950, to see how the current Syrian state should be crafted. Of course, they would go beyond the old texts, but they would certainly take them into consideration as their point of reference. In, in, in a visual sense, we see that the Syrian revolution is using a specific flag as their national symbol now, which is the flag that was in use before the unification between Egypt and Syria. It's this green, white, black flag, as opposed to the current red, white, black flag that is the current flag of Syria. So this is also a sign. This is also a sign that this specific phase is used for inspiration and it's not only used by the Arab opposition but also by the Kurdish opposition. So, for instance, anti-regime demonstrations in the Kurdish northeast do use not only the, the Kurdish flag but also this pre-unification Syrian flag, the green-white black flag. I would like to ask you, do you think this is useful or do you think um, this is rather like conjuring up an, a myth of pure origins that would not uh, hold the test of reality? My sense is that maybe at the current moment it, it, it is a necessary tool to ensure that the revolutionary movement has a point to refer to in terms of the unity of the nation because otherwise it might just lead to a splitting up of the various components of Syrian society after the fall of the regime. Thank you very much. All right, thank you for, for that question. I think 
Um, I think I've got the gist of it. Um, and I think what we see in many examples is looking back into former constitutions, looking at uh, perhaps pieces that can be pulled out, but really, uh, whether it's the Constitution of 1950 or 1930, 1964, 1973, I don't think that there's really anything there in serious constitutional history that would work today in 2012 uh, for the country. I think it needs to be broken, as I mentioned before, completely uh, scrapped and started over again rather than picking out pieces from before. In addition to that, the, the state structures need to be dismantled and reformed. <clears throat> you mentioned the flags. Um, from what I understand from uh, friends in the region, uh, what we're seeing is these, um, these symbols of the state, um, symbols of unity uh, in, in the flags and also in the slogans. Uh, you hear uh, Kurds who are, are shouting uh, in Arabic, Sha'ba Suri Wahid, know that the Syrian people are one. You hear um, every Friday that these, um, these Fridays are named different things. One was uh, Ina Azadi, the Friday of Freedom in Kurdish, where the Arabs were actually using that. Uh, so you have these, these symbols that, that are being used, you know, whether they're flags or slogans, I think to show that unity. Um, but I don't think you're going to find it in, uh, in previous constitutions. Could you please stand up when you answer your question because we are having a, a audiovisual recording. My question is to Mr. Chandar. Uh, I have difficulty in the recent uh, engagement of Turkey's. I don't think that uh, the religious sects uh, were not that prominent in a, at any time of Turkish foreign uh, policy. Uh, the engagement is mainly on uh, the Sunni sect. Uh, yes, uh, there are uh, Kurds in uh, Syria and everybody would like uh, uh, not, Turkey would not like them to uh, get a special status uh, but uh, other than that beyond universal standards uh, we see that Turkey is engaging herself on the basis of religious beliefs and uh, the reformist and democratic position Turkey's uh, government has abandoned that uh, for a year now and they are now uh, exerting major uh, pressure on the Kurdish people and uh, the world is uh, watching it uh, and it remains silent. There are almost 7,000 people in jail right now in Turkey and nobody is raising an objection or questioning this. This, what I call, is political genocide, in my opinion. So in Yüksekova, uh, the uh, s s simple civilians, uh, shop owners, uh, tradespeople, they are now being collected and jailed as well. We have to question this. This the, uh, Turkey is, again, assuming the nature of an undemocratic country. How would, you, how would you interpret this? Is there maybe another reason that I don't see? This is a difficult question. Well, I just made an... I can answer your question by my, making only an analysis. I cannot say uh, or shouldn't say anything as a representative of Turkey. I don't represent Turkey here. I represent myself. Secondly, from what how you put your question, I understand that uh, the owner of the question is also uh, have a, also a critical approach to Turkey's present position. Well, 
uh, the government might be very upset uh, when they hear what I'm going to uh, say, but uh, actually Turkey is learning many things while on the road. Uh, they are trying to find out or, or to do what is impossible, and when they see that it is not to, uh, doable, then they make a fine tune on the way. And uh, uh, what we call the Arab Spring right now was something unexpected everywhere in the world. It was not expected in the United States, and equally it was totally unexpected in Turkey. Uh, so uh, although there are uh, storytellers who say that the whole th behind the whole thing is the United States, uh, and on the 15th of March in Syria, 15th March uh, 2011, uh, the incidents in Syria started then. And uh, almost uh, for a year now, uh, many people uh, went uh, on the street knowing that they would be killed as uh, part of the game. So if this is a game, then these people will lose their lives. Uh, why? Because some other foreign country told them to do so. This is a fallacy. I mean, this I can't believe. So, but... Uh, and Turkey has been caught uh, in this wave. On the one hand, Turkey is uh, has a pro-change government structure uh, because they represented an objection, and that's how they came to power in 2002. And they realized real, uh, they really realized change in the country, and that's why they could augment their votes every uh, at every election. So, uh, uh, and uh, it, it took its position in vis-a-vis -vis the incidents in Tunisia uh, and Egypt from that background, which you couldn't do in the case of Syria, because we have the problem of the Kurdish people and the Alawites in Turkey. So uh, the uh, governor, the the. Uh, uh, and uh, the foreign minister, uh, Ahmed Davutoglu, uses the word Nusayri uh, for the Syrians. And when we call them Alawi, no, he corrects. They say, no, 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 Alawis, that, that's different. These are the Nusayri people. So what he angers him most about Syria uh, is uh, uh, what angers the Syrian most is that they are not called Alawites, but Nusayris. So uh, the fact that uh, Ahmed Davutoglu makes that sect distinction is an indication. So they do not want uh, uh, to put the two groups into the same category. Therefore, it may makes the difference with the Nusairis. But at the same time, there are Nusairis also in Turkey, in Hatay, for instance. So from the very beginning, uh, Turkey has been very careful not to assume a position that is based on the sects, but the, uh, the image they give is totally the contrary. And uh, an example from my experience, as an answer to your question, I can say that last year when we went with Prime Minister Erdogan to Iraq, uh, after Baghdad, we visited first Negev and then we went to Erbil, and then we came back to Turkey. In Negev, there is uh, the tomb of uh, Prophet Ali. Obviously, it was visited. But the political uh, purpose for going to Negev was to uh, go 
to Merce Taklitusi, Ayatullah Ali Sistani, who is uh, one of the most prominent figures of uh, the um, uh, of the Shiites in uh, Iraq, uh, and uh, that is important because he is to the Velayet Fakih uh, doctrine in Iran. And it is a major, uh, he has a major influence about the other uh, Shiites in other countries. So uh, the uh, meeting uh, with the prime minister and this personality gave the message towards Iran saying that you are following a sect based policy, which I don't. Uh, so uh, I ha am having a meeting at a uh, prime minister level with a a religious political leader. And the second message was to Ayatollah Sistani saying that if the uh, developments in the region would uh, convert into a uh, uh, war amongst regions, that will be the disaster of all of us. So do anything you can in your power uh, in order to prevent that. That was the message that the Prime Minister Erdogan wanted to convey. So it it was very symbolic. And uh, that was uh, the third visit to Prime Minister Erdogan to Baghdad. And for the Sunnis and Hanafis in Turkey, one of the most impart, important posts uh, po, uh, sites is uh, the tomb of uh, Ebru Hanifi. Uh, first, uh, he wanted to go to uh, Ebru Hanifi's tomb and then to Negev. But see, uh, what is symbolically important is uh, that uh, first he went to uh, the tomb of uh, Imam Musa Kazim. Uh, and uh, so there is a bridge uh, between the two tombs. The one is the Kazimiye, and the other one of the side of the bridge is the uh, uh, Azamiye. So first they were supposed to go to Azimiye and then to Kazimiye, but no, he didn't do that. He went first to Kazimiye and then to Azamiye, and then he crossed the bridge again and went to Negev. Uh, so all this were signals that Turkey was not assuming a sect-based uh, position. And this is what had to happen if Turkey wants to be a, a power in the region, because he has to act as a power which is beyond and above all religious sects. Because in every square centimeter of uh, uh, the Middle East, there is a competition between Turkey and Iran. Uh, so that was all related to this fact. But the uh, incidents in Syria, obviously, uh, what we call the uh, Arab Spring, they were all in the Sunni area, Tunisia, Libya, uh, Egypt. But uh, what we call the Syrian people, where 75% uh, is our Sunnis. And uh, this uh, is a place where uh, they have very close uh, relations with uh, Turkey. And the regime is massacring exactly these people. And uh, the, the, core, the, the core of uh, the uh, AK Party in Turkey is the religious uh, Sunni people. And Syria is massacring in their own country exactly these uh, uh, groups. And also the non-Arab actors, Iran and Turkey, uh, should uh, be the leading powers. But we have the uh, Shiite and Sunni rivalry between Turkey and Iran, which dates back to, uh, the, uh, uh, to the long years uh, in the history. So uh, Turkey's new position uh, automatically emerged uh, from, uh, and that was not a chosen policy, but it is a policy uh, uh, that uh, historical dynamics 
force Turkey to do. And the only way for Turkey to overcome uh, this uh, position, which I try to apply, is to have a proper new constitution, because that will be a social contract. And this should be a really democratic uh, constitution, being beyond all religious beliefs and sects, which will be open also to the Kurdish uh, people. This is the only way to save Turkey uh, itself from the present position, the, which it not, did not assume on its own free will. Thank you. Microphone, please. If it's a follow up, please go ahead. Yeah. No, sorry, I didn't want to precede you, sir. I only wanted just to continue with a question to you. Uh, you see, I'm asking from a European background, German background. And uh, we, of course, if we analyze in our history those wars which we know as the religious wars, 30 years of utter awful violence between Catholics and Protestants. There we can analyze that these religious things were only, let's say, um, well, uh, they of course were important because they could incite emotions, but the reasons for this was and the destruction were political, uh, European political reasons. And my, uh, uh, I, I'm not quite sure that I understood you right. Do you really feel that, let's say, the Sunni, Shia, and sect questions could be essential elements of the tensions in these regions, or are they not predominantly political ones? I think uh, they are not mutually exclusive. There's a profound religious uh, schism uh, between the two main sects, Sunnis and Shia. But definitely, that already existing schism, which is very, very profound, which goes to the very early days of Islam, actually, is used for political ends. Uh, but they are intertwined. They are intertwined. So just uh, looking at it, as a uh, source of manipulation by a certain political entity should not suggest that deep in the psyche or the, the subconscious of uh, the societies in the Middle East, whether they are Shia and Sunni, this uh, centuries-long animosity uh, do not exist. It exists. Um, the uh, political actors make use of it for political ends, but they exist. Iraq, for example, the, the carnage in Iraq after the American occupation uh, between 2003 <coughs> and the year 2010, for seven years, there are very many exaggerated figures. One million people got killed, which is around, still, it's a very important figure, but real figures is someone, something between uh, around 150,000 or so. It's very, very big. But 90% of those who got killed is not, uh, are not killed by Americans or fighting against Americans. 90% of those killed is the, the product of Shia Sunni fighting, the, the, the international fighting within Iraq, which shows us the deep back, historical background of this uh, sectarian uh, schism in the region, plus now we have the political uh, actors uh, making use of them. Uh, five questions. Yeah. Uh, sorry, this uh, issue of uh, Sunni and Shia in Iraq and Iran, it is, it is clearly important, but it's fundamentally political. Uh, Iraqi Shias are very different to Iranian Shias in terms of their historical origin and in terms of their formation. Iraqi Shiism is very new, 18th century. 
Balkh of Iraq, she has a very new, and uh, in Iran it has a much longer history. But what is also is missing here, which is making this, if you like, a religious war is, uh, in my opinion, is not discussed here, and it is the extremely negative influence of Saudi Arabia. This is extremely negative influence of Saudi Arabia. Saudi Arabia would do anything for not have another uh, Shia government in Iraq. Not a repetition of Iranian case. And uh, I would say from what I know, they should be held responsible for bulk of this violence which is going on there. Uh, but uh, fundamentally, I agree with my German friend that this is a religious uh, veneer for uh, a very deeply rooted political uh, div divisions. And of course, religion has been mobilized. I mean, we have had seen Europe, contemporary Europe in Northern Ireland, you know, that uh, how religion was mobilized for political ends. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, Jay. Uh, my question is for uh, Mr. Wally. Um, so you started by saying that um, Iraqi Kurds uh, experience more rights than, say, in comparison to Turkish, Iranian, Syrian Kurds. Uh, oh, sorry. <laughs> Wally. Um, <laughs> So that Iraqi Kurds comparatively have more rights, but that in general they still feel they don't have enough safeguards. Um, and then you ended by saying that the project of federalism in Iraq has failed, and you fear we're heading towards a bloody separation. Um, so I wonder, you know, what in your opinion do you feel needs to be done for federalism in Iraq to be successful? And is that even a desirable goal for Iraq and for Kurds in Iraq? In Iraq, there is a basic problem, the problem being that there is no thing called the Iraqi people, because there's no such identity. Everyone is basing itself on his own identity. People in Iraq um, declare themselves as being this or that identity, depending on what they feel. Um, what uh, In the elections, what the Americans wanted to do was to have like an Ak party model where a party would get votes from the north, from the south, and everywhere, whereas the Kurds voted for the uh, Kurds, Turkomans for the Turkomans, the, the Assyrians for the Assyrians, the Shiites for the Shiites, the Sunnis for the Sunni groups. So no one really voted for a different ethnic group. The Turkomans didn't vote. Well. They voted El Iraqiya where they had a contingent for themselves. So this was all um, previously discussed amongst them. Because there's no Iraqi people and because there are three major groups of people in Iraq, things are different. And so this is a, um, a group which has had to get together. And it's been together for many years now. but. Uh, after 1991, uh, this um, uh, this whole issue took on a different uh, turn for the Kurds, and uh, this is something that has to be um, taken into consideration within the constitution. The Arabs, I apologize for saying this, but uh, in the minds of the Arabs, when you speak of federalism, you're talking about secession. Uh, this is uh, this puts you, in other words, as in a separatist position if you start talking about federalism. This is what the Arabs think. And this has to do with their history, with the Arab history, their psychology. 52% of the world is uh, governed through federalism, and federalism is perhaps um, the system of the future. Uh, 
there are uh, people around the world of different uh, ethnic origins and uh, creed, race, and uh, we see that the the world in many countries in the world are mosaics of people. There are different people of different background. In Iraq. Um, the issue is that people don't believe in uh, federalism. If you ask anyone in Iraq what federalism means in Iraq, they say that that means to separate, to divide. Um, and that's why the federal system has failed and it has taken on a different um, character. And in my opinion, the Kurdistan region is uh, has a confederal uh, structure and in its relations with the central government in Baghdad. Why? Because after 2005, the federal structures did not emerge in Iraq. And the, the, there is no Kurdish region, no Arab region. There is Iraq only, the central government in Iraq. And this is said to be a federal system. But um, there are also disagreements between um, political groups. I'll give you an example. Sadr. Uh, was against federalism at the beginning. Why? Because their biggest uh, support uh, comes from Medina al Sadr in Baghdad. In the southern cities, Sadr uh, is not so influential. Al Hakim group supported federalism because they uh, did not have any problem with respect to Baghdad. They were strong in their own area. So it, all of this also has to do with where political groups get their votes from. And the political groups have also shaped the developments, in other words. It's not just the people. Thank you very much. Well, uh, first, I want to compliment uh, all the speakers for their uh, deep and comprehensive uh, uh, presentations uh, in relation to the subjects act they actually covered. Uh, I have no question, but I have a comment. I think uh, while the, cover, you know, the issues covered are deep and comprehensive, as I said, in relation to dealing with the Arab Spring issues, um, I think uh, they were not that deep did not go to really to, to, to the real issues. The uh, issues were first uh, summarized in one, which is the minority discrimination against minorities and the, the, the you know division among sex. And then uh, the, it was even uh, uh, limited to uh, one single issue, actually. And I think to understand and to be able to give advices and enlighten to, to how to and, uh, drive a uh, successful constitution for the, for the region, that we need to go to really to the grievances and aspiration that uh, you know, uh, uh, moved the people in those re regions and uh, brought them to the streets and, uh, you know, uh, 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 make them accept the sacrifices uh, they have to take in order to make the changes that they did. And those grievances and uh, 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 aspirations are far beyond just a single issue related to a minority rights, even though it is, it is very important. Uh, people who move to the street are everybody, are the majority and the minorities. And the, the were all subjected to even the discrimination against the minorities was in part part of the tactics of the uh, uh, of the uh, governments in, or, in order to implement it is uh, uh, political strategy. It is not uh, uh, in some cases it is not a reflection to the of the will and interest of the people. It's a reflection of the uh, deliberate government policies. So, and the, the revolt of the people was in part against even those policies which divided the people and uh, deprived the minorities and created the, uh, you know, the divide between the, the people. I think if we to really be able to uh, provide uh, 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 advices 
and uh, uh, insights in how constitutions in these regions should be developed and should be. We need to go to actually what are the real grievances that uh, 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 you know uh, were in th in this uh, region, and what is the political and power dynamics that is taking place, what is actually there, and what is the, the direction, the potential direction for, for to, to build for the, to, and to move toward the future. What are the alternatives that are uh, open uh, uh, for the people and how to, do, to deal with them? What is the, the dynamics that can? I think uh, the, even the religious conflict between sects and between groups in the, in, the, in, the, in the region. To a large extent, see, when we are not always alive, we are not always part, uh, you know, a, a cause of, of alive problems or a, or a conflict, but they become co a, a source of conflict when, as, as, as sometimes we don't know why. And actually, we know why. We know because it, in the, political strategies and political tactics of the regime, they become actual rule for, for this division to, 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 to exist. And that's why they come to life and they work themselves in one way or another. In other words, a fair, a just, uh, you know, uh, uh, a progressive uh, 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 constitutions and atmosphere of governance, I think will automatically will not eliminate those, will not make the Shia not Shia, will not make the Sunnah not Sunnah, will not make, but will make them able to, to coexist like everybody else, and everyone else in the, in, in the world in a peaceful and constructive uh, manner and become part of a community, of a society that can work together efficiently and effectively uh, uh, towards the, uh, uh, the future. So I think we need to go deep into First, what is the power structure in these uh, regions? How it, uh, how, uh, how, how it works in, in reality? What are the alternative direction of controlling and dictating future development and interaction in, in, those, in, the, in this? And then uh, 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 how this can be you know, made to a, constitution, a constitutional you know, uh, 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 principles and uh, you know, laws and so on. So thank, thank you. Thank you. I don't know if I have to stand up or I should stand up, but the previous one of the previous speakers did, so I'm going to do that. My name is Mithin Karatash. I'm a lawyer, a member of the Istanbul Bar Association, but I'm not representing the Bar Association here. I have a question to Karim Wali and then also, some question to Abbas Wali. Kerim Wali, in his presentation, said that the Kurdistan region has a constitution. And uh, I'm asking this question in a way to, uh, so as to give you support. Can you give us more information about this constitution in the Kurdistan region? What does it include about minorities, for example? And uh, I believe that. Uh, in Turkey, too, uh, in the new constitution, we will have to uh, uh, consider these issues. And uh, what kind of um, what kind of measures does it include about minorities? And question to Abbas Wali. There is some movement in Iran. We all know this. And uh, doesn't society have some constitutional demands currently in Iran? After 1992, uh, the uh, Iraqi forces all withdrew from Kurdistan region, and uh, we had a parliamentary election to uh, govern the uh, region, and many laws were enacted. Iraq's constitution, Article 141, uh, approved all of the laws which were passed in uh, Kurdistan, saying that they were not in conflict with the Iraqi constitution. In the 1990s, Kurds also uh, tried to put together a constitution. There was a discussion about this in the Turkish media as well, because the discussion here was that uh, the Kurds are ready for independence. They even have their constitution. This 
Uh, in fact, uh, regions have the right to enact their laws. So in June 2009, a draft of the constitution passed from the uh, Kurdistan parliament, but it uh, was not put to the referendum. It was supposed to have been put to the referendum in months' time, but it wasn't done. Uh, in that constitution, uh, we don't use the word minority. Uh, we say other ethnic groups. We have education in five languages. Turkomans have Assyrians have um, quotas. They have 11 uh, seats. And then, uh, so one Armenian, five uh, Turkoman, five Kaldanis and Astrians have seats in the parliament. So there are these quotas. The total parliament is a, is, um, uh, a little over a hundred. Uh, and uh, there's uh, uh, Turkoman is a second language. So education is provided in those languages. In Turkoman areas, uh, they have autonomous rights according to this uh, constitution. And this constitution also has Is, uh, says that it's a constitutional right to practice one's sect and um, pr uh, forms of prayer and so on. Uh, well, the talk I, <coughs> I gave, I uh, mostly focused on uh, the structure of power, its distribution, the struggles uh, around uh, the... Uh, the, the competing uh, conceptions of power in the constitution and how they were formed. I did not get down to issues of what exactly the various aspects of the constitutions were, constitution were about, nor I looked at uh, the idea of constitutional reform very much inside uh, society because of the time. Now, there is uh, clearly a demand for uh, the constitutional reform in Iran. Uh, this demand is raised from uh, various directions and from among various uh, sectors of the population. The constitution of the Islamic Republic, it is fair to say, is uh, ethnic blind. It is uh, gender blind. It doesn't see gender issues in terms of rights and entitlements. It doesn't see ethnicity in terms of uh, uh, certain rights and entitlements to, to and uh, it doesn't recognize those differences. For instance, the Kurdish uh, issue or the ethnic issue, not just the Kurds, because there are Azeris, there are Baluchis, there are Tur Turkmen's, and the Kurds are one of them, the second largest after Azeris, in fact, are the largest in Iran, in terms of an, uh, an ethnic grouping. I don't like the term minority, I hate it, I don't use it. So the a grouping that I am saying, the ethnic grouping or ethnic sector that they are there. Uh, the constitution, articles 15 and 19 of uh, Iranian uh, constitution, 1-5 and 1-9 does address this issue in terms of uh, recognition of what he calls local languages and local cultures. Local languages and local cultures must be given uh, the right uh, to be spoken and written alongside the Persian la language, which is constitutionally the official language. Shi'i is 12 Shi'ism is the official region constitutionally, which means that uh, about nearly 20% of Iranian population who are not uh, Sunni Muslims, uh, Shi'i Muslims, are not part of this official identity. The same would go in terms of language for Azeris, for Baluchis, for Kurds, for Turkmen's. And uh, there they don't talk about uh, these languages in terms of ethnicity, in terms of their identity, they talk about local languages, and there should be given the right to be used alongside, um, alongside uh, Persian in uh, primary education. Thus far, none of this has been realized. There is uh, no education in the, 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 There is only in the, the, the likes, in certain ways, like here, 
that you can see that Kurdish can be taken as an elective course in university, as an elective course. There is no degree in Kurdish, so to speak. But there are publications, you know, so on. It is under, uh, you know, specific control of uh, the government. So there is a great deal of demand for constitutional change among the religious uh, groupings, which uh, are not Shiites among the Persia, among the Azeris and, and uh, Baluchis. But their larger aspect of it, which I referred to, is uh, the call, the demand, the central and absolutely pivotal uh, demand for uh, restructuring and changing of the constitution. And this demand really focuses on uh, changing the structure and identity and uh, organization of power in Iran, which uh, as uh, it was uh, very rightly mentioned by Christian here, uh, raising such a demand would go down to the heart of the existing state, which means that if you raise such a demand, you basically say that I do not want this system. I want this system to be changed, and without changing that system, it would be impossible to carry out such a radical constitutional reform. Thanks. Sanam Samshi Sulevni. I had, yes, that gentleman. Benim de sorum. My name is Sanem Güner. I come from Holding Center, which is a think tank. I have a question to Rebwar as well. It's a continuation of the previous question. Can you tell us a little bit more about uh, different political dynamics within the Kurds in the north of Iraq, uh, in the Kurdistan regional administration? Because to us, looking from the outside, we think of it as being rather monolithic, which it probably isn't. So uh, what are the political dynamics uh, within the Kurds in Iraq, and uh, how does this play out in the making of the constitution and in the political processes? So this is my first question. And the second question about um, the relations with the Syrian Kurds. How, how, what kind of mechanisms exist? How do you communicate with the Syrian Kurds? Or I shouldn't maybe limit this to just um, the Syrian Kurds. Because I just said this because Syria is very much on the topic, but on the agenda. But uh, generally speaking, what about your dynamics for communication with Kurds in other parts uh, of the geography? So how practically does it work? A difficult question, uh, as uh, Genghis Shandar said in response to a question before. It would take hours to talk about all, uh, the answers. But uh, before 1991, there was the Kurdish Front. And after 1992, um, this um, front got in power. <laughs> this was actually two main parties to main parties, KDP and KYP. And then there were some Islamic groups, communist groups, but these were smaller. And uh, these groups did not clear the 7% threshold in the 1992 elections. The smaller groups didn't. And then with the civil war, there was a division uh, within uh, the Kurdistan region. KDP and KYP had two different uh, regions. They managed these, uh, governed these regions separately. And then in 2005, they got back together. But this is still a work in progress. Uh, and uh, with the freeing of Iraq, there is now um, an opposition in Kurdistan. They were originally Islamic groups, and they were getting 10% of the vote, and they were weaker, and they were entering the government with KDP and KYP, and they played, they had a low profile. But um, in 2009, in the July elections, a new group called Goran came about. And as a result of alliance between KDP and KYP, uh, they got 59% of the vote, and they're still in government. 
and this was the time when the draft constitution was passed from the parliament and the opposition in the parliament objected to this constitution saying that this should not be the way the constitution would be made and that it had to be a national document. So that's why the referendum, which was supposed to have taken place a month later, was not carried out. So, so Goran, which is the opposition group, doesn't have all these votes. And they did not put uh, this uh, draft as a, in a referendum. So they took the uh, objections into consideration. But in February 2010, with the Arab Spring in Suleimania, people were on the streets for 62 days asking for reform. They wanted change, corrections. They wanted the uh, constitution to go back to the parliament. And they wanted uh, fight against corruption. So these are the uh, demands of the people. And Mesut Barzani, took, uh, by taking these demands into consideration, established a, a commission and uh, started punishing people around him. And uh, this made people happy to a certain extent. But it's an ongoing process. And uh, uh, the opposition is strong, still strong. And the opposition can take um, laws which are enacted in parliament uh, for discussion. They create discussion in the media and within the non-governmental organizations. For example, there was a law about demonstrations. And this law consists of 11 articles. One of the articles said that uh, permission had to be taken from the governor's office 24 hours before the demonstration. They objected to this article and uh, they want just notification, no granting of permission. So uh, the article says that uh, the governor's office has to give permission. But they wanted to remove that. They just said notification within 24 hours of the demonstration. And this they managed to do. So there is no permission uh, aspect to demonstrations. Another point, on Sunday, I was around table with uh, Mr. Barzani when he came back from US and from Turkey. And we uh, talked about Syria. They're a little passive, I think, on Syria. The regional actors, the two big regional actors are in conflict with each other, but there are also some regional actors which are their extensions. And, and, and KDP, if, uh, if, PK, if we define PKK as a regional actor, then it's Iran's um, extended actor, and Barzani is for Turkey. So these uh, two other regional actors, as extensions of the two main rival, uh, re rival forces or rival countries, are also in conflict with each other. And uh, so if uh, some sort of um, agreement can be reached, then we can take a position. But if there's no position, uh, if we cannot reach an internal agreement, then we cannot really uh, be an actor in the, what's happening in Syria. Well, we have 10 minutes left, this gentleman, and then the gentleman in the back will just take those questions uh, and quickly, please. We're talking about the Ottomans, the Shiites, the Sunni, and uh, we're talking about problems which have ex existed uh, hundreds of years. And if we can resolve them on a constitutional platform, uh, this would be great. But I think that as I listen to all these discussions, what about the rights of women and um, yeah, and the gay community. I'm not just talking about other ethnic identities or ethnic identities, in other words. I'm talking about individual freedoms. What about individual freedoms? Aren't we going to be discussing individual freedoms? Because the problems you're talking about are problems which have not been solved in the last seven, eight, nine hundred years, maybe. We will try to solve them perhaps through the technique of the constitution making. But uh, so what about women and the gay people? I asked this question to Abbas Wali and also to Reb Wire too. What about them in this whole picture? In the sense of individual rights. Microphone, please. I answered this question in the context of uh, the Constitution. 
this, this can be answered in the context of the larger politics of Iran, but that takes too much water. It is uh, it's different. So uh, what I am basically answering here uh, is uh, the, what you know, gender and uh, what may be called sexual difference has been seen in uh, the Constitution. I said uh, the Constitution is gender blind you know, in so far as gender can become the basis for specific rights and entitlements, you see. And uh, in terms of family law, in terms of penal code, and so on and so forth, the fundamental source of uh, legislation is Islam. In family law, and in terms of uh, penal code. And uh, what remain, and uh, this, said there are Islamic Republic in Iran is fairly paradoxical sort of entity. This said, you cannot say that these kind of uh, restrictions that exist in, in the constitution has stopped women, in, you know, women employment or their participation in the economic and political life of uh, the country. It has not. There has been, in fact, an encouragement, but it's a guided encouragement, encouragement in specific directions. You see? For instance, they are very much restrictive of, there was a movement of called the Million Signatures, which a women's movement were collecting signatures in relation to the recognition of women's right and so on and so forth. Government was imposing serious restrictions. It's still now, some of the activists of this movement, very successful movement, are in prison. But on the other hand, government is encouraging its own if you like, uh, values its own, uh, if you like, interest in the direction of mobilization of women. In terms of in employment of women, participation of women in, in, the, in political life, uh, in uh, sort of administration, and so on and so forth. For instance, if you take uh, women out of uh, primary education in Iran, it will collapse because overwhelming majority of the teachers are women. You see, and government does recognize this that cannot run the primary education in Iran without the help of women, but tries to frame it, okay, and guide it. Imposes its values on it, but there are areas which activity of women are strictly forbidden. That is when they are raising the question of gender, gender equality, and so on and so forth, which either impinges on the established religious values, or it is creating a situation for government, which if the government comes to address those ideas, differences, it will open up a serious sort of confrontation. So they that. And insofar as uh, the right of the uh, gay people are concerned in Iran, it is total ban. It is absolutely total ban. That it is not recognized, as you remember, when Ahmadinejad went to the Columbia University, you know, to, to Columbia University to speak there, he was asked this very question. And his answer was that we don't have gays in Iran. You see, which that was his, uh, his answer. But Maybe he, that's what he believes that day, that I don't know. But uh, <laughs> this, is, this is basically, so uh, this, is not, this is not just not recognized, it is, it is a kind of anathema in Iran, you see. But having said that, there is, there are very, very, there is another dif direction. For instance, they are very uh, open about uh, sort of... Uh, recognizing the necessity of sex change. I watched a, a program, uh, a BBC program on this very issue. I think it's BBC or Channel 4 in, in, in London, I watched it. It is that actually sex change sort of clinics in, in, in uh, uh, Tehran are uh, sort of increasing in number. Uh, and the, the demand for sex changes. Some would say that I've also read articles say that 
this is also an expression of sort of uh, sexual repression, repression of gender repression, that some would want to change sex because of this, even if they are not clinically, if they are not, if you like, uh, medically identified as people being on the borderline, they go and say that they want to become a man because to be a man in Islamic Republic is much better. <laughs> you see, this is Danny. Now, I'm not, I don't want to carry this to, to an extreme. They said that I have read things indicating this, but I don't, I'm not saying that this is true or not. But in coming back to the, the there is that you can't, not there in constitution, nor in any legal, other legal document, nor in terms of the dominant Shi'i, prevailing Shi'i culture, you can in any way raise the gay issue. Thank you, Professor Roy. Uh, I'll take both of... Let's take three questions together and then let's answer them. Thank you. I have uh, two direct questions to Mr. Shandar. The first question, I have to phrase it well to make it clear. Uh, you are quite right, the influence of Egypt over the Arab world for decades. You have mentioned the importance and influence of Turkey and Iran in the Arab world. Uh, when it comes to the comparison between Egypt and uh, Tunisia in terms of Islamic influence, I, uh, from my point of view, I think there are quite different Islamic movement in these two countries, even the origin is the same. But in Egypt, they are more conservative and more uh, fundamentals from the early uh, 20th century. We have, we have uh, seen the, the exercise of power, theological power of Islamist bro uh, Islam, uh, 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 Muslim brothers in Egypt in 1926 uh, in uh, Al Qahira University uh, when they called Ta Hussein uh, uh, apostate. And this continued up to the moment. Uh, lately, three days ago, uh, the well-known artist, Adil Imam, had been put in, in jail. So the question, the dominance of uh, Islamists in, the, in, in Egypt, how do, you th how do you see their influence in rewriting the in constitution in Egypt and its influence in the uprising uh, countries? This is the first question. The second question, you have uh, said also, you have mentioned the competition between Iran and Turkish uh, in the Arab world, and which is true. How do you uh, describe the competition between uh, Turkey and Saudi Arabia over the Islamic world and Arab world? And wha where are the positive points you see in this competition? Thank you. The competition between Turkey and Saudi Arabia. Oh. Aralım siz onları bir aklınızda tutun. Ee, şu beyefendi bir de beyefendiden ondan sonra. Ee, ben Azat Zal, Kürt Yazalar Derneği'nden. I'm, uh, I would like to ask a, uh, make a statement about the concept of Kurdish problem. I think that is an improper concept and it has to be abandoned in the future because, because in uh, South uh, Kurdistan was called Northern Iraq and the Kurdish problem is a concept that has been determined from the outside. Uh, it should be mentioned as the Kurdish cause or the Kurdish struggle. Now, my question uh, to uh, Rebwar. I would like to this. Uh, I would like this question to be answered by a, a person who is Kurdish. 
since the uh, beginning of the last century, since the uh, borders were de uh, determined, uh, Kurdistan uh, was uh, disintegrated and the process of constitution started both in Iraq, in Turkey, in Syria. Either Kurds were um, neglected or they were added up and then they were oppressed uh, as a result of the Kurdish struggle. And this is the case also today. This is how the Arab Spring it seems to me. Uh, the opposition in Syria and in uh, is still um, disregarding Kurds. The same happened in uh, Iraq. So how uh, do you see whether the Kurds can be included in the constitutional process? And if they were to do so in Iran, uh, Syria, uh, and Egypt, what kind of a uh, reaction would it see? And what would be the result of this vis-a-vis -vis the Kurds? The last question. My name is Mansur. My question is to Christian, to Mr. Sinclair. As you know, in the continental Europe, particularly after the Renaissance and after the Commonwealth, uh, for 400 years now, they are uh, moving very slowly in democracy. Uh, uh, with regard to ethnicity, feudal, uh, feudal feuds, how will uh, the democracy be established in the Middle East? Because democracy in the West was established, could be established through the um, agreement of different social groups. Uh, can we be hopeful for the same to happen in the Middle East too? Second question. In the Gulf countries, why isn't there any Arab Spring there? And why is the Spring uh, attempt in Bahrain uh, been suppressed? Yes, very briefly, uh, we have to conclude in five minutes, and then we have to go to lunch. In the first question directed to me uh, was uh, the comparison uh, between Egypt and Tunisia uh, and uh, the historical uh, roots of the Islamic movement in Egypt that was uh, mentioned and it was defined as a more uh, radical and more uh, conservative. That is true. That is correct. And uh, in every country of the uh, Arab Spring, they all have uh, similarities, similar characteristics, but they also have major differences. Uh, Tunisia is coming from a very, very different historical background. Both countries were uh, in the past uh, under Ottoman rule, and then uh, Tunisia went into the uh, rule uh, and control of France. And uh, uh, their uh, state structure has uh, also Kemalistic uh, features. And uh, um, the, after the establishment of 1926 of the Muslim Brothers in Egypt, they have had a different uh, movement. So uh, the common point between the two countries is that uh, very recently, they demolished totalitarian uh, structures. Hosni Mubarak in Egypt and also in Tunisia, uh, the uh, president was overthrown. Uh, although they were coming from a different background and very different regimes, there was a point in which they could meet. And uh, also, the election results were similar. Uh, one, the mainstream. Uh, Islamic movements won in the elections in Ihwan uh, in Egypt. 
Now, uh, trying to answer your question from all these uh, starting points, uh, well, I also have to say, actually, is that uh, Egypt, the population in Egypt is structurally conservative. When you compare it with the Tunisian society, uh, the Egyptian society by, uh, in itself is conservative. And that is also reflected upon the recent elections. This was uh, the real picture of the uh, Egyptian society. So how could that uh, be seen in the uh, preparation of the Constitution? This is what is under uh, discussion. Uh, because uh, it has also similarities to Turkey. Because we uh, have uh, had a military regime uh, in 1982, uh, but they declared themselves as a transitory regime from the very beginning. And in a very uh, short period, they prepared uh, the constitution of 1982. And uh, then they immediately held elections, and the regime was normalized. Will it be like that? Because in Egypt, uh, the uh, Egyptian Ardi, um, army and the generals also, they start uh, every discourse with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. This is unthinkable for Turkey. Uh, could you imagine that any general or any a soldier, even in the Turkish army, would start in his or her statement with Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim? No. But because uh, now they have a transition period and because they had the possibility of uh, coming to power, the Islamists in Egypt were forced to, to abide by certain democratic parameters and they uh, had to reflect uh, uh, them in the constitution. This is uh, nothing harmful. And uh, the uh, movements uh, that uh, we could call jihadi movements, they were also having their origin in the uh, Muslim brothers like Sayyid Qutub. Uh, even then, they say it was uh, marginal. They were, these groups were in the Muslim brothers, but they were not in the mainstream. So this is uh, like the difference between uh, the AK party and Refah party in, uh, in our case. Uh, so uh, we, this is what we would uh, expect uh, from the constitutional uh, movements in Egypt now. Uh, the competition between Turkey and Saudi Arabia, uh, yeah, that is that is a competition where, which Saudi Arabia is and cannot be winning, because one of them is Wahhabi, and they are uh, using their oil richness in order to expand the Wahhabi sect. However, the buyers of Wahhabi sect are very limited. It is creating important results, but in the Islamic world, this is not a trend that could be generally accepted. The Wahhabis have always been a very small group. And the value of Turkey here is uh, also important from this particular point of view. In the um, uh, checks and balances in uh, the uh, uh, the, the main uh, importance of Turkey is that they, uh, Turkey is now uh, decreasing uh, the power of Saudi Arabia as the representative of the Sunni uh, belief in the Islam. So this competition is a beneficial uh, competition, and it is a competition where there is no possibility whatsoever for Saudi Arabia to win. Now, the last question, why isn't there any uh, Arab Spring in Bahrain? Well, we can't uh, make it uh, a, um, a condition that if something happens here, it has to happen elsewhere too. No, these are historical develop, uh, developments. It happened in Egypt. Why? Because it was an autocratic regime. Uh, it is happening in Syria. Why? There was a similar regime there. In the Gulf, 
uh, there are not vast demo uh, vastly democratic structures, but uh, they have a different uh, reality because in most of the Gulf countries, the majority of the people living there are not natives of those uh, countries, but the Indians, the Pakistanis, others who were attracted to those countries uh, by the um, petrodollars. So these are not uh, real societies or real uh, governments because they were they were not uh, existing structures uh, before. Maybe at one stage democracy will come also to these countries, but to now uh, there is no need for that. Bahrain is. Uh, a different uh, country because the population of Bahrain is equal to the population of from here to Tunal uh, district. A, a, a handful of people, most of them are Shiites, and the government is in the hands of the Sunni. So Bahrain is uh, a um, area of uh, uh, competition between Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia. So Iran and Saudi Arabia have a geopolitical competition in the Gulf countries, uh, particularly in Bahrain. Thank you. Rebarbe will talk to you one by one afterwards. Sorry. <laughs> Can we predict democracy in the Middle East in 30 seconds? No. <laughs> um, Obviously, it's, it's something I can't answer. You know, how long will it take? Yes, you're right. It's, it, you know, it's, it's something that develops over time. It's something that, that's organic and has to come from the people. You have to try on different sizes of democracy to see what fits. Um, it's, it can't be imposed. But uh, Syria, and I can only speak of Syria, that's, that's why I'm here, um, they've had, they have no democratic traditions. It's going to take a long time, I think, coming. And unfortunately, in today's world where everyone is looking for instant gratification, there's going to be a lot of disappointment. Uh, thank you to all the speakers. Uh, I have two announcements. Uh, 